Science Project is a rebel in the new science revolution aimed at exploring the nature and implications of consciousness in the universe through the fields of quantum, quantum physics and the paranormal. paranormal. No reality left unchecked. No dogma left unchallenged. Q. Science. Science. And now your host for the Q Science Project, Jill Hansen. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year and welcome to a brand new season of the Q Science Project on KJRDB The Planet. I hope that everyone had a wonderful end to 2016 and has much to look forward to in the coming new year. Around here, we're hitting the ground running to start off our 2017 interdisciplinary exploration of the nature of consciousness and reality with a great lineup of upcoming guests. You're not going to want to miss Single Friday this year. In January alone, we're going to be diving into a healthy spectrum of topics, uh, beginning with next week on Friday the 13th. Nationally recognized shamanic healer and author Evelyn Rizdick will be joining me to explore what insights ancient Scandinavian shamanism may offer about the nature of our fundamental reality. In the last segment of that show, Dr. Michael Lennox will be stopping in to give us our quarterly infusion of positive vibes and catch us up to speed on what the current articulation of cosmic geometries may be telling us about the goings-on of humanity. On 120, Dr. Michael Suddeth will return to the queue. This time around, he's going to address everything spooky and anomalous. And on 127, we are going to have the first episode of 2017's uh, Objective Reality with my co-host, Dan Willis. The show is booked almost solid through the next few months. If you want to get a more expanded and detailed overview of what's coming as far as guests and topics go, venture over to the QScience website at qscience.org, and that is spelled Q-P-S-I-E-N-C-E dot O-R-G, where you'll find everything you need to stay informed. Now on to tonight. Tonight, in the first of many panel discussions already scheduled for the 2017 season of the QScience Project, we bring together two very pragmatic, well-informed, open-minded perspectives in this ongoing dynamic quest for answers. For the next two hours, we will be mulling over the evidence which supports a fairly new perspective in the scientific scheme of things. The notion that this thing we call reality may not be as it overtly looks, feels, and seems, but could actually be a complexly rendered digital simulation. Leading us down this deepest of rabbit holes, I am excited and honored to have both Tom Campbell and Jim Elvidge with us tonight. First, Jim Elvidge is an expert in complex computational systems, holds a master's degree in electrical engineering from Cornell University. He is a patent holder and author of a fascinating book called The Universe Solved. With over 20 years of research in cosmology, quantum mechanics, philosophy, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and the paranormal under his belt, Jim has kept pace with the latest theories and discoveries on the cutting edge of scientific understanding. It's this breadth of knowledge which informs his theory of reality, which is so perfect and powerful that it explains all known scientific and cultural anomalies. Drawing from a body of strong evidence, which he believes shows that consciousness is the source of reality itself rather than simply an artifact of brain function. And further, Jim believes that the evidence points towards an apparent programmed nature of reality, which is based on a self-evolving system. There is a significant overlap between the concepts presented in Jim's writings and ideas with those of tonight's second panelist, nuclear physicist, author, and pioneering consciousness researcher and expert, Tom Campbell. Tom has been a serious explorer of the frontiers of reality, mind, and consciousness, as well as psychic phenomena since the early 1970s, when he began researching altered states of consciousness with Bob Monroe, and at that same time was instrumental in getting the revered Monroe Laboratory up and running. His book, My Big Toe, represents the results of reality from both the physical and metaphysical viewpoints and expresses a model of existence and reality that is based directly on his own scientific research and firsthand experiences. His theory of everything is truly a theory of everything, unifying under one seamless scientific understanding, science and philosophy, physics and metaphysics, mind and matter, purpose and meaning, the normal and the paranormal, and even objective and subjective reality. Um, let's see. So, uh, Tom was one of my first guests on the Q Science Project way back in October 17th, 2014. I'm very excited to have him back. 
you have many accomplishments and I only mentioned a few. Is there anything you wanted to kind of throw in the mix? Well, I can add uh, some current events oh, to yeah. what you've yeah. already talked about. Okay. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was in Los Angeles and gave a presentation where I outlined a series of, of physics experiments, uh, quantum mechanics experiments, that would uh, verify um, the virtual reality concepts that uh, I talk about. So, you know, we, we always hear from uh, the science community that we need to be able to verify what we're talking about. It's called falsification. It needs to be falsifiable. And that's a problem for us sometimes because we're talking about consciousness being, you know, creating this reality that we call our physical universe as a virtual reality. Therefore, consciousness has to be outside of this reality. So with, from a viewpoint inside our virtual reality, consciousness is non-physical. And to right. falsify to, to falsify our ideas, we need a physical experiment that shows the non-physical. You see the logical problem with that. So it's a, it's a difficult thing to do. But I have come up with a series of quantum mechanics experiments that indeed will do that. What they do is that they, they perform several um, what I call minor miracles, which is they have a result <laughs> that... Uh, would be totally and completely impossible from the viewpoint of a physical reality. And, you know, the, the double slit experiment does things like that. It uh, sure. has particles uh, spread themselves out in a diffraction pattern when there's really no physical reason why that should happen. So these are several more that are even dramat more dramatic than that. And uh, because I'm using virtual reality concepts in order to um, define these experiments, and I'm taking virtual reality concepts and rewriting quantum mechanics with it. So the quantum mechanics is no longer a, a weird science, it's just a normal science. And instead of something that, uh, as Feynman said, you know, will, you know, will never be understood, uh, it's something that is perfectly logical. So if you look at it through the lens of virtual reality, quantum mechanics isn't uh, that weird at all. So what I've done is I've taken these experiments, explained them through that lens of virtual reality, said, you know, how they set up and what the result's going to be, this thing that's totally impossible, of course, from a material viewpoint. Yeah. And when they get done, there's going to be no other conclusion possible, I believe, other than, yea, verily, we are living in a virtual reality. Yeah. And that consciousness is the computer. That is amazing news. How did you come up with these experiments? And can you tell us a little bit more about them? Sure. Well, they are quantum mechanics experiments. They all... Uh, kind of takeoffs on the double slit. We're just doing so a few different things. You see, the way that, the way physics works and things with like the double slit is you try to put uh, reality into back it into a corner and uh, try it, get it to do something impossible to show us a little bit about what's going on behind the curtain. That's right. kind of the way the experiments work, and that's the way the double slit experiment worked. They did something uh, which is throw particles one at a time at two slits to see what would happen because we know that light's a wave and we should get wave patterns but we know that if light's a particle like photons then we should just get a pile of particles behind each slit because that's what particles do mm -hmm. so now we trap mother nature if you like between a rock and a hard place what are you going to show us mom and what happened is she showed us one of her secrets uh, you know behind this uh, this veil if you like and that oh. is that if you send those particles through there one at a time, they redistribute themselves in terms of a diffraction pattern. And again, there's no physical explanation for that. Um, now, I now I do, I do have one quick question before you go further, right. Tom. Now, do you think because we're talking about this, you're, you've done virtual experimentation, how easy is it going to be for people to be dismissive of the research and the, you know, what you're doing? By saying, well, Tom, you know, that's all well and good, but, you know, this is just a computer. What no, kind of I'm, I'm doing physical experiments that will be set up in a physics Ooh. lab with all physical equipment and uh, we'll end up with physical results. Oh, my goodness. Yes. It's and a whole so, series of these. Oh, my God. And yeah. so what you, what, I just want to wrap my head around this. So what you're saying to me is that you see this actually proving that we live in a simulated reality. Yes, it does. But proving is kind of the wrong word. In science, okay. 
Nothing is ever proved. Yeah. It just provides evidence for, but it's going to provide uh, evidence so so firm that it's going to be very hard to you know dodge around that evidence and come up with some other explanation if these experiments work. Now, of course, that's what right, we're right. predicating yeah. this on. You know, if they don't work, then uh, you know, game games. <laughs> all over there but uh, yeah. if it does work then we're going to have a set of quantum mechanics experiments done in a lab by hopefully you know uh, caltech or mit or someplace with a lot of credibility and they will get a physical result and that result will be absolutely impossible so uh, unless you look at it from a virtual reality and then it will be absolutely predictable yeah so i've predicted the results and we'll see what happens yeah now the last time we spoke, I kind of, I, one of the questions I asked you was from your position, from, you know, is what you do and, and, you know, your group of the people you inter interact with, um, what is the general consensus within the science community as far as something as wild and crazy as simulation hypothesis actually being real? Since we last talked, which was about two years ago, have you seen kind of more of a push or at least an openness towards this kind of thinking? Oh, yes, tremendously yeah. so. You know, if we go back when I first uh, wrote my books in 2003, myself and uh, Edward Fredkin and maybe one other person were the only people in the universe that I know of that thought virtual reality was a good idea. Everybody else thought it was nuts. And now it's, a, it's probably the biggest new thing in physics departments all over the world. Well, yes, so there are lots of physicists that take virtual reality very seriously. Um, you can, you know... I watched a video from CERN where they were talking about uh, finding Higgs and so on, and the reporter was just asking physicists a little bit about, you know, the nature of reality. And they explained yeah. that we don't consider an electron anymore to be a particle with charge. That's old and that doesn't work. We consider an electron to be a point with the attributes of charge and the attributes of mass. Well, how do you describe an electron in a computer? It's a point with attributes of charge and mass, you see. So physicists all over, all sorts of uh, different kinds of physicists, really, uh, different fields, have come to this realization that the best way to explain their experiments is by positing that this is an information-based reality. It's not a matter-based reality. It's an information-based reality, and that's just a, you know a, a fancier way of saying a virtual reality. It's computed. Yeah. So that's become a very big thing. Yeah, I would guess. Now I've taken no data, but I would guess that probably uh, you know 30% of all the physicists out there who are still uh, you know thinking mm -hmm. and uh, working probably think virtual reality is is a something on the you know, on the docket to talk about. They're taking it seriously. That's now awesome. Now, there, there's a oh. bunch of people, of course, that will say it's nonsense, but, you know, you always have that, I'll you know. That, the, right? It's yeah. a new thing being widely accepted in physics now. That's amazing news. And Tom and everyone else, we actually have Jim Elvidge finally on the line. Jim, welcome to the chaos. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jill, and uh, uh, good to talk to you, Tom. I, I had to go. To, I had to go to my phone. The laptop just wasn't working. So. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you made it. It was kind of touch and go there. I wasn't sure if we were going to hear from you tonight, but. Yeah, excited absolutely. To I'm excited to be joining. Great. So catch me. Catch me up a little bit. Catch, okay, Tom. So, Tom, why don't you just give um, Jim a little bit of a, a primer on what you were telling everyone else? I'm sure everyone else can use a few minutes to kind of rewrap their mind around that one. Okay, well, I'll try to make it shorter so we don't have to do the whole thing again. <laughs> but what I was, what I was uh, telling Jill is that uh, a few months ago in L.A., I did a presentation where I presented a bunch of physics experiments, um, quantum mechanics experiments, that when they are done in a lab by physicists will have results that will verify that not only this is a virtual reality, but that consciousness is the computer. Oh, well, that's really cool because we, I've heard many people asking about, um, you know, viability of the theory and how can we right. demonstrate it. And most of what I've heard so far has come from like uh, Craig Hogan at Fermilab who's building that uh, holographer. Um, and so this is, uh, this is very interesting. It's uh, good news, Tom. Yeah, well, the better news is that the experiments are not that hard to do 
and not that expensive to do. So it's not like I'm asking something that's really, really going to take a long time before they can figure out how to do it. I'm asking something that uh, probably any major university physics department has the equipment, uh, you know, in a closet someplace can pull it out and do these things. And if they don't, uh, it wouldn't take a lot of money to to fix that problem. So it's things, it's experiments that I hope will be done this year. That's great. Yeah, um, one of the things I've always thought was kind of interesting is our view of matter as time goes on. You know, back in the 1800s, we thought it was these, you know, billiard ball types of, uh, you know, blocks of matter. And, and you know, if you had, a say, a gold bar or, or something, um, basically it was just compressed uh, stuff like that with a little bit of space in between. Um, and then in uh, 1911, Ernest Rutherford and others found that there was a nucleus and that most of the matter, most of matter, most of an atom was an empty space. And it was kind of like one to the minus 15th in terms of how tenuous it was. And then uh, quantum chromodynamics, quark theory in the 60s and 70s broke that down even further. And we find that neutrons and protons are almost empty space. And then string theorists are saying that even quarks are almost empty space and they're vibrating bits of string. And at that point, you start saying, well, if the only thing that defines a particle is a number, the frequency of the vibration of that string, what do you even need the stuff for? You just need the number. That's exactly right. Yes. That, uh, that idea of building, thing up, building our reality up out of little pieces, a uh, bottom-up uh, viewpoint, just doesn't work. You know, reality isn't like that, and you will always be able to break whatever it is we find into pieces until you get down to the pixel level of our reality. Exactly. Uh, you know, once you get down to the pixel level, then you can't break it up anymore. But we're a long way, you know, above the pixel level. So we've got quite a long time yet for these elementary particles we keep finding. You know, they called them elementary because they were supposedly fundamental and couldn't be broken apart to simpler things. So we called them fundamental. We called, you know, electrons fundamental and we called, you know, um, well, lots of things, pro protons and all these things right, were fundamental right. pro particles. And now, of course, like you say, we break them into pieces and then we break the pieces into pieces. And there's really no end in sight for that other than the price tag on how expensive it is to keep breaking them into pieces. That's <laughs> exactly. going to be the thing that stops us. And, and it doesn't really mean much because there really aren't any particles there anyway. As you say, it's information. And the reason that you keep having empty space is there's nothing for you know to put in that space there's nothing there yeah it's just uh you know it's the attributes of the particle you know, i was mentioning that's, that's uh, just before you you came on that uh, i i read or listened to a little uh, video that was made um when they were looking for the higgs particle and some reporters were there talking to physicists and the physicists explain that today we don't think of electrons as chunks of mass with charge and you know, little chunks of mass with charge. We think of them as points with the attributes of mass and the attribute of charge. Well, attribute is, is information. And the point is also information. And that's what it takes to make the physics work. Because if you look at it as a little particle with charge, you can't, you know, you can't, uh, you can't get the right answer. You don't yeah, exactly. uh, end up... Uh, showing what the experiment's going to do. You get the wrong answer. But if you treat it as a virtual reality, as just points and attributes, then you can compute the right answer. So quantum mechanics has kind of left particles behind a long time. It's just the physicists haven't been able to catch up with their thinking. They're, they're still kind of stuck in a Newtonian view. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's, it's just because it just seems so that way. You know, it, we, when you touch something, it feels hard. It feels like we're actually making contact. We're not making contact with anything. It's, it's a force between, you know, your body and the, you know, the object that you're trying to touch that makes it feel like you're touching something hard. Um, that force, again, is, is just rules. It can just be data being processed to say, oh, you're very close to something now, and therefore you're experiencing this sensation. So well, uh, I, think, I think it was John yeah. Wheeler that had the it from bit theory, the, right. the idea of a single electron all the way down. I think that was actually very prophetic because probably what's going on is in order to 
create an electron, you need some sort of finite state machine or some, you know, little tiny process that's going on that, that makes the electron do what it does. But you don't need more than one instance of it. You need, well, you need multiple instances of the same state machine. So ultimately, sure. it's the same thing. Well, you see, we experience this all the time when we play video games. If I take my Sims character and I go to the bar to party with my other Sims characters and Sims friends, and I get a beer and they slide that beer down the bar to me and I pick it up, take a drink and set it on the bar. Well, why doesn't that beer fall right through the bar? You know, that bar isn't real <laughs> and neither is the beer and neither is the Sims guy. So how come you can slide that beer you know, along the bar and pick it up and set it back down there? You say, well, you just calculate that. It's a, it's a calculation. It's just yeah. the way we have it here. So, yes, to that Sims guy, that bar is just as solid as wood, just as it is here in our virtual reality. And exactly. you can hit it with a hammer and you can dent it because it has properties according to the rule set that define the virtual reality. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the uh, video game model because – as much as that seems a little bit separate from a scientific uh, point of view, it's a, it's a very good model to understand. People can grasp the idea of wearing VR goggles or you know, having some immersive experience um, where the, the, the generation of their sensory experience is, is coming from a computational system. They can get that. Right. Um, but to get that about reality is a, is a big leap for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, here's an easy way that I've found to, uh, to kind of take people by the hand and lead them through that, and that is that there's a few general rules about virtual reality, and all virtual realities work the same, whether it's the World of Warcraft or the Sims or the one that we live in. They all have the same attributes, and those attributes are that the computer that computes the virtual reality can't be inside the virtual reality, right? It has right. to be outside the virtual reality in order to compute it. All right? That's because a virtual reality can't compute itself. So the computer has to seem non-physical to the character. You know, from a perspective inside the virtual reality, your computer has to be non-physical. Now, the other thing is that what is a virtual reality? It's a conversation between a computer and a player is what it is. The computer and the player send data back and forth. The player makes a move or does something. The computer computes the consequences and sends that data back to the player and says, here's what happened. So the, the player and the computer talk to each other. Then they have to be in the same reality frame. You can't just chat back and forth if you're in two different reality frames. So that means the player also has to be outside of the virtual reality. Now, when we look at, say, World of Warcraft or The Sims, that's obvious. From the point of view of the elf, say, in World of Warcraft, the player and the computer are both not in his reality. They are, in Fredkin's words, in other, you know, some other place other than his virtual reality. What that means for us is that given if this is a virtual reality, then the player and the computer must be non-physical to this virtual reality, and the computer and the player must be in the same reality. Well, what is a player? A player simply makes choices. That's all they do. They get data. They make choices. They send those choices. They get consequences. It's just a choice maker. Well, that's consciousness. That's what consciousness does. So consciousness is the player. Now, when we're playing World of Warcraft, that's what we are. We're the elf's consciousness. If I'm playing an elf, I tell the elf what to do. If I don't give the elf directions, it just stands there and wobbles. It doesn't do anything. But if I say jump or run or fight or you know do a backflip, whatever, it'll only do it after I say that, after I make that choice. So consciousness, the choice maker, and that choice is a free will choice. So probably raise another whole can of worms, but it's a free will choice. <laughs> and it has to be in a reality that is non-physical to the virtual reality characters, which is, of course, our body. Our body is the avatar. Our consciousness is the player. And part of this larger consciousness system is the computer. So we and consciousness, all, we and the computer and consciousness, all part of the same system. So that takes a simple little subtle logic that applies to all virtual realities and shows us that we, what we call ourselves, is not, is not the body that we are the consciousness making the choices 
and we're living in a virtual reality, and this body is an avatar. See, that's got a lot of neat ramifications, like, you know, your avatar dies, but you, the player, don't. You know, when your elf dies, what do you do? Well, you go pull him out of the graveyard and run back and get your stuff. You know, it, uh, <laughs> you, you, uh, you start over again with more right, knowledge than you had before. Right. You start over with more knowledge than you had before. That's what you do. So you, the player, are immortal. Your okay. avatar, like the elf, dies, comes back, dies, come back. You know, that's the way the game is. Otherwise, the game wouldn't be very interesting. If you signed into World of Warcraft and they told you, look, guy, you're just going to have one chance here. As soon as your elf dies, you're out of the game. You can't come back. Well, there wouldn't be very many players for that because that would be no. a real dull game because, you know, your elf gets killed a whole lot, particularly in the beginning when you're not very smart about the system and how it works. So you have to have this, you keep coming back because otherwise the, the whole thing is, is a, is a, doesn't work. So now just that analogy to a video game tells us an awful lot about this virtual reality that we think is our physical universe. Now, yeah, it sure does. So, Tom and Jim, uh, sorry, Jim. I hate to interrupt. Um, it is time to take our first break of the evening. Things got off kind of to a, a little bit of a rough start. Uh, we're running a little bit behind. But everyone, I just want to make sure that you do come back after the break. We do have a lot more deeper diving into this, this amazing topic coming right back at you. We will see you in just a few minutes with questions from the chat room and more of Tom Campbell and Jim Elvidge. See you in just a minute. statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Work with your doctor when taking medications. Make Protovite part of your healthy lifestyle. Healthforliberty.com is your source for Protovite, a powerful nutritional supplement that's a true breakthrough for your health. Poor digestion makes it nearly impossible to absorb the nutrition your body needs. Protovite is a liquid multi-nutrient formula with patent-pending absorption technology and the highest quality ingredients to nourish every cell in your body. My name is Sandra White. Six weeks ago when I started taking Protovite, I was on 14 medications from everything for blood pressure to fibromyalgia. In the first 10 days, my blood sugar dropped 50 points and my fibromyalgia pain is gone. And so was 12 of the 14 medications that I was taking. I'm 66, living life and loving it. Go to healthforliberty.com right now. That's healthforliberty.com. Thank you, Protovite, for giving my life back. For the thousands of wounded warriors returning from battle, Wounded Warrior Project has developed the Warriors to Work program, a career counseling service that helps wounded warriors translate their military experience to a civilian job. These extraordinary men and women bring more than just teamwork and inspiration to the workplace. They bring proven world-class job skills. And to ensure proper placement, Wounded Warrior Project works with employers to find just the right job fit. Talented, skilled, and eager to get back to work, you have the opportunity to hire a seasoned veteran. Contact Wounded Warrior Project at findwwp.org. Welcome home, the brave. If your home has hard water, then it's likely that LimeScale is clogging your pipes, damaging your appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars each year. You can eliminate LimeScale in the entire house with HydroCare products available at Wave Home Solutions. Easy and efficient with no maintenance, no salts, no chemicals, and no coils. And you can buy with confidence from Wave Home Solutions. Performance guaranteed. Just go to bestwater411.com. That's bestwater411.com. Thank you. 
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. The station that won't put you to sleep at work. KGRA, the planet. Welcome back from the break, everyone. Thanks for sticking around for more of the Q Science Project with me, your host, Jill Hansen. If you're just tuning in tonight, I want to welcome you to what could be one of the only conversations you'll ever need to hear on the topic of simulated reality. With us tonight, bringing us the most current of the mounting evidence in favor of this fascinating controversial cosmology, are preeminent digital philosophers, Tom Campbell and Jim Elvidge. While you're listening to tonight's discussion with Tom and Jim, please take the opportunity to check out both gentlemen's websites. You can check out Tom at my-big-toe.com and Jim's is the universe solved dot com yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it that's it so and also uh, if you guys have any topic re- topic related questions for tom and or jim i'd love to get those on the air for you tonight all you have to do is hop over to the kgra chat room and that can be found at kgraradio.com forward chat forward slash chat room or also on twitter just hit me up at q science that's q p s i e n c or use hashtag q p chat so now, gentlemen, we do have a bunch of questions kind of piling up from the chat room, but I know, Jim, that you, there was something that you wanted to add to the conversation that was happening before we kind of had to go into a break. So please, you have the floor. Go ahead and say what you need to say. Sure. Thanks, Jill. Um, yeah, no, I wanted to uh, follow on with uh, what Tom was saying there about how the virtual reality idea a video game can give you kind of a, uh, a model for something that leads to the realization that consciousness can be separate. Um, in addition, it, it gives you a, a perfect model for, believe it or not, solving a lot of the anomalies in quantum mechanics, which seems pretty counterintuitive at first. But if you think it through, you realize that, um, let's say you're in a uh, kind of a, a, you know, a, a fantasy video game of some sort, a virtual reality game, and you've got a tree in the game or, or just some sort of object. Nobody needs to know what is inside that tree until somebody cuts the tree open. Or let's say there's a, a, you know, a building that, that has locked doors on it and nobody's ever been in the building. So until somebody goes into the building, nobody needs to design the inside of that building. The, the system doesn't need to waste CPU cycles on generating you know, a beautiful interior to a building that nobody can go into. But as soon as somebody creates a key, key or finds a key and turns the key and opens that door, now the system does have to create the inside of that building. And it can do that dynamically. It's a lot more efficient for a system to create, quote, reality, uh, in that case, a virtual reality, dynamically on an as-needed basis. And if you think about that, that's exactly what happens at the quantum level in our, you know, quote, virtual reality, but what people call a physical reality. At the quantum level, we find that our um, observation effects change the results of experiments. So, you know, it, it's, it's the exact same kind of thing. We don't need to know that this particle went through this slit or that slit until we actually observe it. And then it has to be determined that it goes through one or the other. There's no sense in the system wasting any computational c- cycles, locking it down into one place or another until it is needed. So, so that kind of explains the observer effect. And it also explains entanglement. You know, the idea that you want to make an efficient system... Um, entanglement in quantum mechanics is the idea that two particles that are once entangled or once uh, generated at the same time or in close proximity can be separated arbitrarily far and they're forever in lockstep after that. What one does, the other does. So when you make a measurement on one, you know what's happening with the other one, even though it's light years away. Instantaneously, you know what's going on. And it seems to defy, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity a, a bit. But this actually makes perfect sense in a computational model because you have, again, a, uh, an instance of something like a finite state machine that describes that 
particle, those two particles, you effectively would seed that with some sort of a random number seed so that they're always working in lockstep going forward, and then you can separate them as far as you want in the, in the game. So, you know, in one step, uh, you know, the, the virtual reality construct explains separate consciousness, it explains quantum mechanics anomalies, believe it or not. Yeah, that's uh, exactly right. Uh, that's what I've done with these experiments. I've basically re rewritten quantum mechanics, if you will, from the viewpoint of virtual reality. And it turns out to be a simple logical process, not mysterious science at all. So that's the idea. Virtual reality does describe quantum mechanics uh, uh, you know, without all the complication. Uh, right now, if you want to know the result of a fairly complex quantum mechanics problem, you've got a lot of math to do. You know, it's going to take you some time crunching on a computer to get the answer. Once you understand how it works from the, from the viewpoint of virtual reality, you can just look at the logic of the problem and, tell, and say what the answer is going to be. You don't have to calculate because now you understand what's going on. Yeah. Uh, you have to calculate when you don't understand what's going on, but you do know how to do the math. And the funny thing, Tom, is that over the years, because quantum mechanics, it, it's gotten to the point where our technology has caught up with some of the kind of hairy edge limitations of, of the reality that we live in. And so it's, it seems to be very anomalous. And yet nobody has let go. Most scientists haven't let go of this idea of a deterministic, materialistic, you know, mm. objective reality out there. So they come up with the many worlds theory. And, if, you know, if you can go to Wikipedia and look up um, interpretations of quantum mechanics, you'll find a dozen or so, maybe 15 of them. Uh, there's, there's pilot waves. There's all kinds of things. And they all... They all fail to explain the observer effect at the end of the day. Right. Only the theory that you and I uh, are talking about can explain that. Right. Right. What they are are very desperate attempts yep. to put um, material, you know, causality, deterministic causality, back into the, you know, back into uh, physics, and it just doesn't work because physics doesn't work that way. You know, that's not the exactly. way reality is made. So that's why they're having trouble with it. And you know, and we it's have kind of new- funny. Yeah. Why, why are we all so uncomfortable with, with uh, the lack of determinism? <laughs> well, I can tell you why, why physicists are very uncomfortable with that. And that is that as soon as you say that this is a virtual reality, there is one big question that pops up. You know, it's the elephant in the room that says, oh, uh, who's the programmer? Right, right. And where does it come from? You see? And Do you think that science- comes from? Ultimate, that is the ultimate source of discomfort when people are faced with this process? Yes, I think that's it because, you yeah. see, scientists have already boxed themselves into a corner that says reali- this physical reality is all the reality is and it's material and it's built with little particles from the ground up. Yep. That's their catechism. That's their belief. It's just a belief, but that's how they pulled away, split away from religion back uh, in the you know, 15th and 16th century and became the bastion of, you know, logical process and reason rather than that, that believey, touchy feely stuff, you see, that you get when you say, who's the programmer? You know, if we're just a subset of something else, well, this something else must be bigger and greater and more fundamental than us. And, uh oh, it's starting to sound like, uh, you know, religion again. So it's just fundamentally terrifying to somebody who's built his career on the ideas of, uh, you know, particles and determinism, material viewpoint, to realize that uh, they're just a subset of a bigger system that's non-physical, you see. Right. And I think that's what sticks in their crawl. And they just don't want to go there because from the scientist viewpoint, that's leaping back to the bad old days when – the high priests of our culture were religious priests instead of what we have today where the high priests of our culture are scientists, are physicists. You know, what am I defining as a high priest? Well, the high priest is what tells the people what to believe. And science yeah, I, is now in that role, that, that role. And it used to be that the religious people were in that role, and science doesn't want to give it back. Yeah, and I think it's unfortunate because um, – you know, there, there was there was a lot of richness to 
you know, the, the pre-scientific point of view. And, and unfortunately, what's, what's happened is it's like a house of cards. To admit that there is something else out there, you know, every level of the, you know, your research and, and what you're known for and why you get tenure and all of this kind of stuff, you know, is dependent upon that. And so it, it takes a, you know, a rare, brave scientist to say, you know what, there's actually something to that. However, that said... You know, I've read a lot of quotes from Einstein and others that seem to imply that they believe in a, in a larger purpose and a larger. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's it's it's. Yeah, if you if you go back, uh, Jim, back to the you know the early twenties, late, uh, you know, well, I guess turn of the century and and up through about nineteen twenty five or so, you look at uh, you know Schrodinger and Planck and Einstein and Bohr and all of the big guns, you know, Heisenberg, if you read the things they wrote, what they were saying is, wow, this is exciting. We have seen, you know, we've done experiments that show us that reality isn't anything like we thought. It's totally different. It's probabilistic, and it's not material at all. It's not deterministic at all, because probabilistic and deterministic just don't go together. And they were excited about it. It was... Um, Mm -hmm. Like we're on the verge of, you know, a whole new science here and it was a big deal. But the problem was that nobody came up with any theory to explain what it was because virtual reality in those days wasn't even, you know, a concept oh, that existed. Right. So they right. didn't have any tools. They didn't have any conceptual tools to do it. So after the next 50 years go by and everybody trying to explain why quantum mechanics works the way it does, you know, is banging their head against the wall. Well, what do you do next? Well, what do you do next is walk away from that wall, stop banging your head on it, claim that nobody will ever know, and that's just the way reality is, and go on. And that's basically what they've done. Now, this virtual reality come, takes us back to that point in the early 1920s, and I think people are starting to get a little excited about it again because it actually answers the mail it answers the questions it can explain the experiments and nothing else can so it's just better physics it's not like this is a you know some idea that people have dreamed up and are trying to sell it's better physics yeah and i think uh, i just came across a quote here max planck in 1931 said i regard consciousness as fundamental i regard matter as derivative from consciousness i mean that's profound at that right. point in time yeah and all those guys all the big guns there uh, that really were the leaders in this movement, they all pretty much came to that conclusion, including Einstein. He struggled yep. and struggled with it, but eventually he came around to that same thing. And what he, I don't have a, the quote, but basically uh, paraphrasing it, he said that he understood that consciousness was fundamentally at the root of it, but he just didn't have any concepts of how to explain that, you know, how to write it down, what to do with it. So he spent a long time with his unified field theory that was going to explain it and came up empty-handed. So, hey, if you're Albert Einstein and you spend 20 years on a project and you come up empty-handed, then who else is going to charge that windmill, right? It's, you can just claim that it can't be done and go on. So, yes, we're still stuck back in the Newtonian world that uh, was uh, the universe is a, is a big clockwork. And also, I'm wondering, both of you, this this can go to both of you, I'm wondering how either of you or both of you feel about the, you know, on the individual level, um, whether or not there may be fear when people confront this idea as far as the implied personal power that would exist in a reality where it's really, as Tom, you know, often talks about, just literally ma almost manifesting some from potentiality and making it be. Do you think a lot of people are, would be comfortable with that concept? Yeah, I think they might have some fear yeah. with that, but I don't even think their mind goes that far. You know, I'm not <laughs> sure that they come to that conclusion yet. Most of the physicists that are now saying virtual reality is a good idea, that we live in a, a, a world, we live in a universe that is information-based. And there's a lot of physicists that will say that now, but they don't dare take the next step and say, well, what does this information-based mean? They just say it's information-based because they've been drug-kicking and screaming to that conclusion by their own experiments. But they really don't like to talk about Fredkin's other, you know, that it has to be created in a 
you know, in another reality frame. It can't be created here if this is just a, uh. a data universe. It's obvious. It's like third grade logic, but it's just avoided like the plague. So I'm not sure they're really thinking that. I think that's still kind of a thing, a thought that that uh, shouldn't be thought about. So though yeah, they're espousing, I, I agree. yeah, they're espousing yeah. virtual reality as a as a uh, a concept of this being an information based reality, but they are not taking any logical steps past that point. That'll have to come more slowly. And that's what I hope my experiments will do. It kind of pushed their nose in it to the point that if those experiments work, then there is no other explanation for the results that they get. The results they get are completely at odds with a physical reality. And Yeah, I, I agree, Tom. I, I think uh, Conrad Zeus and Ed Fredkin, uh, it's kind of like materialism in a way. They didn't really support the concept of a free will. It was more like a digital determinism uh, model that, that yes. we're in. And, and I think that's what a lot of scientists have uh, right. latched onto. And then there's the other camp of the, you know, holographic projection, the black hole, you know, 3D to two, uh, 2D uh, dimensional yes. surface projection, which to me is just ridiculous. It doesn't support any idea of separate consciousness for which there's tremendous other evidence, you know, near death right. experiences, out of body experiences, mystical experiences, uh, paranormal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it doesn't explain uh, any of the quantum mechanics anomalies. It's not in sync with, you know, mystical experiences or any metaphysical anomalies either. So the holographic projection is just another example of a digital model that, that you know, satisfies certain experiments, but really doesn't cover the base of all the existing anomalies out there. Exactly. It's just another desperate move to maintain Newton's concept of the universe and re reject this idea that this is not a physical reality, that it's, that it's uh, informational, because then they have to deal with that very hard question about other, and they just don't want to go there. They figure other, questions of other, you know, if we're a subset, where's the superset, and who runs mm -hmm. that, and where did it come from? All that sort of stuff is not science in their mind. That's philosophy and religion, and they don't want that to be a part of science because suddenly their world now gets real squirrely where it used to be real well-defined. And I think that's scary. So fear, yes, Jill, I think it is fear. It's, it's very basic fear that the, the, the beliefs they have, and they believe physicists, well, scientists in general almost, and all, yeah, just scientists in general believe in this deterministic, bottoms-up, clockwork universe model. And they've believed in it so long that I don't think that they can easily make that turn. But eventually they will, because like I say, it's just better physics. As they get more experiments that are even more dramatic than, than the double slit to show them that the world just isn't like they thought it was, they will start to come around. First, just a few, and then more, and then more, and, you know, what was it Planck said that uh, physics progresses one funeral at a time? Right. <laughs> I think that's... <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah, I was just going to say, the, um, the other thing here, Tom, I think that, that happens is that as you develop more and more expertise, and this is the path of science, uh, of scientists, is they, they go to school and they, they major in a particular field and then they get a master's degree in, in a more narrow field and then they get a PhD in an extremely narrow field and then they continue to do research in an even more narrow field. You can't be an expert in a broad range of things all at one time. There's not enough time, there's not enough brain capacity to do it. So you're an expert in a very narrow scope. Um, right. I think it was Mahatma Gandhi said, an expert is someone who knows more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. But, um, but, but that makes it impossible for somebody who, who is brilliant in their very narrow niche to understand the big picture to understand right. computational systems, to understand yeah. uh, complex adaptive systems, to understand quantum mechanics if, if you're a you know, DNA expert or whatever it is. But sometimes you have to have a little bit of breadth to put all these things together. Yes, that's true. And when you don't know about something and you don't have big pictures, what do you fill that void with? Belief. Right. So we have a bunch of scientists 
who are fundamentalists in their belief and they're sticking to those beliefs, you know, whether the, you know, whether the evidence is contrary or not. So that's what we've got. And that takes time to change. You're not going to work that off real, real quickly. That's people are going to struggle not to let go of that belief, but it, it's going anyway because it's better physics. And I sort of have this yeah, theory totally of, of, of 30 years that it, that it takes to overturn a well-defined, um, you know, concept or belief system in the scientific world. I mean, this was the case with uh, with asteroids and meteoroids. You know, it was believed in the 1800s that anybody who saw rocks hit the ground coming out of the sky was delusional. There was because there was no explanation for it. Um, you know, another one is uh, cold fusion. Cold fusion was was a you know an anomalous thing. didn't didn't match our known mechanisms for fusion reactions. Um, so those guys in 1989 were kind of laughed out of the scientific community. But then almost 30 years later, 2012 at CERN, they said, well, what they call it then, low energy nuclear reactions, it bears further study. And what Fleischmann and Pons did was had a lot of validity. There's, you know, the history, scientific history is replete with these 30 year periods where it goes from, you know, this is a ludicrous idea and it's pseudoscientists and crack pottery to, oh my gosh, you know, this is a revelation. But yeah, it takes but you, a long time. Well, you know, that's changing, though. We're, we're on Internet time now, and there's a few things different about this one. One, information travels much faster and much farther than it used to. But two, a much bigger thing is that when you talk about virtual reality, this is something that affects Everybody, you see, it's not just some very highly uh, technical subject that only a handful of people on the planet can discuss reasonably. This is something, this other, well, where is it, you know, where is this virtual reality created, you know, in other? Well, what's other? Well, it's non-physical, non-physical. Oh, we're, we are a, a subset of a non-physical world. That's going to get a whole lot of people's attention. And we may find that on this one, the scientists are, are drug kicking and screaming into a bigger picture by, you know, non-scientists who will get the idea, understand it, and uh, get there ahead of the scientists. So they're going to have some social pressure pushing on them, whereas there was no social pressure about the physics of meteorites because that wasn't something that people were particularly interested in in the masses. But this other is going to trip a lot of switches and it's going to make a big difference to lots of people. So they're not going to be able to sit back in their ivory towers and discuss it for 30 years. <laughs> it's just <laughs> not going to happen this time. It's going to go a lot faster than that. And I think we'll see change, you know, coming pretty dramatically. Uh, I mean, it'll be slow at first, but it's going to accelerate. It has already been 15, though, since uh, Bostrom wrote his simulation theory paper yes. since we we had ideas like the matrix in the public domain and and you and i started writing books and things like that it's been you know quite a bit of time already yep. uh, but 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 your point is well taken i, I think it, it it the dynamic is definitely different today yep it is it's gonna it's a different world out there people uh, are plugged in now to information and new ideas and there's there's um it's a it's a different place so i think the the pace of change is going to pick up. Yes, it always starts slow. Like I said uh, earlier, you know, in 2003 when I published my books, you know, there weren't many people who thought virtual reality was sane. But now there's tens of thousands of people who think it's sane, and a lot of those are scientists. An exciting possibility or potential right yeah. there. No, right. the bigger it grows, the faster it goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I'm curious, both Tom and Jim. The, so we're in this very exciting time. We're watching consciousness evolve right in front of us. And we're using this, you know, this lens into simulation hypothesis and how um, uh, attitudes are changing about this, what was at one point a very crazy idea. And I'm wondering, is this going to be something that scientists and physicists mid-career are going to stumble upon this and go over the evidence and go, wait a second. I've just invested 20 or 30 years in the wrong thing. It's time to do an about face and head in the right direction. Or are we going to be reliant upon those, you know, high school kids and, you know, beginning college students right now who are coming upon this information 
and, you know, at the beginnings of their careers, kind of taking that path. I think both of those things are going to happen simultaneously. You know, obviously, uh, you know, there are true believers who uh, will stick with their dogma no matter what the evidence is, and we'll have plenty of those in science. But at the same time, there's an awful lot of scientists who, who will shift to better physics when they see, oh, here's an explanation of quantum mechanics that makes sense. That's going to turn yeah. a lot of heads because, you know, yes, they have these beliefs, but science is science, and a large portion of the scientists are going to see this, complain about it for a while, but uh, eventually kind of get swept up by it because it works better. And in, in one thing that's always kind of tripped me up is the whole Occam's razor issue. Sure. I've heard people tell me that materialism, like go, by Occam's razor, you're going to go with materialism. And that's never, that's never <laughs> made sense to me. And I felt like kind of an outlier. Like, am I missing something? Yes, Why am no, I because, reasonable yeah, enough? If, that- yeah, if, if you look at I, one of the things that, that I do almost as a hobby, but it's a, a core part of, of my second book and was the first book, is categories of evidence. Like I, I spend a lot of time looking for uh, different types of evidence for this kind of what makes our reality tick and why it is the way it is and materialism just doesn't fit much of that you know it doesn't it doesn't support you know all of the digital the categories of digital evidence it doesn't support all the categories of separate consciousness so it's it's hardly occam's razor because it's not even fitting the data but but the other yeah. one that that always baffles me is the idea about the finely tuned universe now you know in in uh, tom's theory the 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 system has evolved to you know with a with a fundamental law of continuous improvement that that makes total sense and you can live in a finely tuned reality simulation because the system has generated that over time but what the scientists cling on to is a combination of the anthropic principle which says that you know for all of the zillion universes that are out there we can only be in the one that makes sense for us to be in and then the other combination, the other part of that is the fact that there are a zillion universes out there, so they have to invoke parallel realities and uh, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and these kinds of things. And that is, you know, it's almost ludicrous to say that's the simplest <laughs> explanation. <laughs> you know, it's far simpler to say yeah. the system, you know, evolved through some, some mechanism of fundamental improvement. Yes, the idea that uh, many worlds has something to do with Occam's razor is about as far backward as you can get. <laughs> it is. There isn't anything that I know of that takes unnecessary complexity to that to that level of absurdity. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of where I was going with it. But we do have to pause, you guys. Um, it is time to take another break, everyone. But I promise that when we come back, not only will we go even further down the rabbit hole in this whole simulated universe, but we're also going to address those questions that keep coming in. I apologize to everyone, um, but it's really difficult for me to break up this conversation. So anyway, we will see you guys back here in just a few minutes. Please stay with us. Would odors, mold, and mildew describe your basement or crawl space? It doesn't have to be that way. Transform them into a fresh, healthy, usable one with the technologically advanced Wave Moisture Control Units. The computerized operation maximizes moisture control and also expels harmful radon, combustion gases, and numerous other pollutants. Dehumidifiers are old technology that do nothing for air quality and waste energy. Wave units are intelligent, self-monitoring, do not need maintenance, and will save you hundreds in electricity. Wave units are still running a Effectively over 15 years. They've been tested and installed in public and military housing and by property managers nationwide. Buy a unit now, and if your home is not fresher and drier, you can return it for a full refund for up to 12 months. What have you got to lose? Call now. 1-888-618-WAVE. 1-888-618-WAVE. Or visit MyDryHome.com. That's MyDryHome.com. Wave Home Solutions. On the next episode of Recipes for Disaster. So we've got our neighbor Paul coming over tonight for a barbecue, which is why I prepared a delicious lemon rosemary steak marinade for my special collection of old family recipes. To make sure the steaks are extra, extra, extra tender, I left them marinating out on the counter overnight, just like Nana used to. 
Maria may mean well, but without food safety, it never ends well. Always thaw or marinate foods in the refrigerator at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or below. Or you could make your friends and family really sick. Maria's neighbor Paul didn't think twice about the steak he ate until he was presenting his company's financial forecast to the board. That's when a sudden bout of food poisoning made it explicitly clear that profits weren't the only thing on the rise. Oh. Watch Recipes for Disaster at foodsafety.gov. You'll learn the right steps as Maria does everything wrong. Brought to you by the USDA, HHS, and the Ad Council. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Work with your doctor when taking medications. Make Protovite part of your healthy lifestyle. Healthforliberty.com is your source for Protovite, a powerful nutritional supplement that's a true breakthrough for your health. Poor digestion makes it nearly impossible to absorb the nutrition your body needs. Protovite is a liquid multi-nutrient formula with patent-pending absorption technology and the highest quality ingredients to nourish every cell in your body. My name is Sandra White. Six weeks ago when I started taking Protovite, I was on 14 medications from everything for blood pressure to fibromyalgia. In the first 10 days, my blood sugar dropped 50 points and my fibromyalgia pain is gone. And so was 12 of the 14 medications that I was taking. I'm 66, living life and loving it. Go to healthforliberty.com right now. That's healthforliberty.com. Thank you, Protovite, for giving my life back. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk. No way you could keep a secret as big as covering up a UFO. Is this how evidence is suppressed? Always has been. Always will be. KGRA. The planet. Welcome back to Friday Night on the KGRI Digital Broadcasting Station, everyone. I am Jill Hansen, host of the Q Science Project, which brings the front lines of the new science revolution to your doorstep in digital HD every Friday night from 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern. Tonight, our interdisciplinary exploration into the nature of consciousness and reality brings us to an amazing conversation orbiting around the evidence in support of a simulated reality hypothesis. With us tonight, uh, two of the most qualified minds on the subject, digital consciousness philosophers Tom Campbell and Jim Elvidge. I'd love to get your questions for Tom and Jim on the air. We already have some piling up, so you might want to hop in there pretty quick. Hop over to kgraradio.com forward slash chat room. Or if you prefer, you can also hit us up on Twitter um, by tagging at QScience, that's Q-P-S-I-E-N-C-E, or use hashtag QPChat. All right, gentlemen, we do have some questions from the chat room, and these go all the way back to the beginning of the show, so I apologize if they're a little out of sync with content, but let's hit them up anyway. The first question um, is from UA, and the question is, would an observable experience of anti-entropy, cold beam, contribute or detract from the virtual reality theory? Yeah, I believe that was anti-entropy, is not entropy. That, yeah. But in any case, uh, well, you know, the answer to that is I'd have to know the, the details of exactly what they're doing when you, you know, that's a very short description, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I don't really know the physics behind it well enough to know whether there's any particular, uh, uh, you know, thing that virtual reality could bring to explain that. So I just have to kind of claim, uh, not enough knowledge by the little bit of of uh, of terminology used here. I, you know, you have to know the, what the physics is in order to know how a, that physics could better be explained um, with virtual reality. I have a, you, a little bit of an opinion on that. Um, okay. If if what they mean is anti-entropy, anti in other words, something that is um, evolving to greater complexity rather than you know something that is. Um, you know, evolving to to uh, to lesser in a closed system, the the thermodynamics says that you'll always increase entropy. Okay. Um, but you can have isolated examples in a closed system, such as creating a baby, where um, you know entropy decreases. Now, in the in in the bigger system, the 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 uh, virtual reality system that we live in, that we feel like is a physical reality, that is. Again, that's within a larger system. 
And if that system is, you know, continuously improving and getting better, then it is anti-entropy. Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure that we were really talking about entropy. You know, we uh, scientists have make, like to make up words, and <laughs> we use all kinds of, of uh, you know, takeoffs on the entropy word. And this is actually written as entropy, not entropy. And I'm thinking maybe that's oh, something oh, yeah. that I just don't know a whole lot about because I'm not familiar with the term. Actually, I see what you're – so, Tom, we have questions coming from two different places. That was Bill's question. Bill was kind of like reiterating a question. And UA from the chat room did, in fact, confirm entropy. It so is entropy. It is okay. entropy. Yeah. So, Jim, what Jim was saying flies. Yeah, what Jim said is right on. Yes, I would agree. Yeah. Sorry about the confusion there, you guys. Um, the next question, assuming you guys are both finished with that one. We good? Yep. yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, do statistically significant unusual phenomena imply that any rules derived from a virtual reality theory are fluid or malleable, i.e. can be changed at will? Um, and no, it doesn't. Uh, virtual reality has to have a rule set. Okay. Uh, in the world of Warcraft, uh, you can only jump so high, run so fast. Uh, if you fall off a cliff that's high enough, you get hurt. Of course, getting hurt there is, uh, you know, your, your hit points go down. But um, anyway, it has a rule set, and that rule set defines the reality. That rule set is like our science. We've, we've dug out nuggets of the rule set we call science. That doesn't change. Now, there are things that you can do, a lot of things you can do in a virtual reality, other than the things that, we, that most people know about, you see. It's not because they change the rules of the fundamental rule set, it's that they don't understand the rules that are there. Like, for instance, a, um, your intent can modify future probability. That's how uh, things like, um, um, let's see what I'm thinking about, that's how things like the uh, um, placebo effect work. You see, you give somebody, a, modify their intent by what you tell them, and they're Physical state changes accordingly. Well, the placebo effect is well studied, and it's not that people think they get better when they're given that sugar pill. They really do get better. And not always, but that 35% of them do. So that effect, that's the same thing we use to heal. It's the same thing we use to, um, you know, uh, well, the same thing that uh, positive people tend to have positive experiences and negative people tend to have negative experiences. That's because... You modify our future probability with your intent. So that's not breaking a rule. That's part of the rule set. It's always been that way. It's just that most people don't know that it's that way. So they might think, ah, that's yeah. a cheat. You know, somehow we're, we're cracking the system. We're hacking it in order to you know, use our, our minds to heal. But you're not cracking the system. You're using something that's always been there. That's not a hack. It's just learning more about how the system works. Yeah, Jill, if I can jump in, too. This might be the first place where... I depart a little bit from Tom. I don't think it's impossible for rules to to not change or to change. Um, mm -hmm. I think you know a rule set could change, if, for example, the uh, the direction that our reality is going for some reason is going to lead to a catastrophe or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe the system you know has some feedback mechanism in there where it says, okay, we're we're going to you know modify the the rule set a little bit. I mean, one one thing that comes to mind is. And, and this, there could be a million reasons for this, but I've often heard that there, um, there was, there, there didn't used to be the concept of blue, uh, the color blue, right, right. and and you know there are some articles written about how it was described in literature in different ways, and you know poems used uh, you know different terminology for it, and, it, and it kind of implied that you know blue is a new color to our reality. Um, another example might be the Mandela effect, where we, you know, see some changes in 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 the past um, that that we're not aware of. Maybe what's going on here is that the you know the mechanism that that generates our reality is saying, hey, you know what? Time to speed things up a little bit. Let's let's give some let's give the people some anomalies to think about. Or I don't know what. I'm just throwing yeah. some ideas out there. I, I I don't think it's impossible for for rule sets to change. Um, you know, in our reality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would agree with you, Jim. With I would agree with you completely about those kinds of things. But I wouldn't call those rule set changes. So we just have a little different definition of what the rule set is. Gotcha. Okay. But just things like that change all the time. Like. Uh, 
uh, um, Rupert Sheldrake in uh, his infamous uh, talk about the, I think it was 10, um, uh, you know, I know he didn't call them fantasies, but the 10, you know, problems that science has. And uh, one of them was that the speed of light seems to keep changing a little bit. That mm -hmm. over the years that we've been measuring it, it's changed more than the amount of just the error in the measurement. And that is a very uh, perplexing problem. But what my uh, take on that is that because we started to dig deeper and deeper and finer and finer detail into our reality, the resolution with which our, res our reality is computed had to get higher. We, had more, we needed more resolution because the computer doesn't waste cycles computing high resolution when it's not needed. But when it is needed, we start smashing atoms and looking at little tiny things, then we need to change it. Well, what do you do to change the resolution? You have to make, uh, you know, your, 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 two, your two pixels really are time and distance, okay, time and space. So you have to make the delta T a little, small, a little smaller so you have a finer measure of time and you have to make the delta space or the delta volume okay, a little smaller so that you have a higher resolution in distance. And C is the ratio of those two. It's the distance over the time. It's the delta X over the delta T. That's C. So all you have to do is keep that ratio the same and C stays the same, but you get a higher resolution. But this is a digital system. You can't change that ratio precisely because it's digital. You have to change it in chunks of, you know, of pixels. You can't go into half of a pixel or part of a pixel. So it changes a little bit, and that's why C changes. Because, yes, the system does make those kinds of changes. But I'd say in my lexicon of rule set, that's still the same rule set. It's just modifying some of the... Uh, the conditions of the virtual reality, but the virtual reality still, you know, works basically the same way. So we're just having a little different definition over uh, what a rule set is. So, it, so Tom, I'm sorry, Jim, if I don't mind. Um, so would you say that updates to whatever operating system our simulation would be operating on, would, would that change the rule set or would that just be modifications to the rule set? What would happen if the rule well, set it's like, changed? Okay, it's, what would that look well, like? Those, if you change the rule set, you see this rule set has evolved to create a stable virtual reality, and that's not an easy thing to do, as the anthropic principle points out. If you move something in the, you know, the fifth or sixth decimal place, you know, the whole thing you know, falls apart, and it's no longer a stable universe. So it has evolved with this set of rules that produces a long-term stable virtual reality. Now, mm -hmm. it's not... It's not infinitely long term. Obviously, one day, you know, the sun will explode. You know, the universe will be nothing but uh, hydrogen gas and elementary particles. That's what the uh, second law of thermodynamics predicts. So it's not perfectly stable, but it's stable enough to give the time for the, for the system to evolve the sort of avatars that it needs for consciousness to play with. So that's what I mean. It's that rule set that doesn't change much because you just can't monkey with a rule set that's, that is – evolve for, to very precisely create a stable system. But you can monkey with the constants. You can monkey with a lot of other details within there. Use lots of things that, that the system can modify or change. But the fundamental rules by which it evolves to be the way it is, that stuff is not impossible to change, but unlikely to change just because it's, you know, it's just like with us in, in our, in our uh, evolved system here. It's a very tightly interconnected web of life, right? The, the mountains and the rocks and the rivers and the people and the critters and the plants and all of this stuff all evolved together. And it's a very tight web well, of interaction. And you can't just jerk any of that around without causing all kinds of other problems elsewhere. So yeah. that's kind of the way I say the rule that stays the say stays the same but still, things can change, and it can modify things, and it's a virtual reality. Virtual reality, hey, if there's a disaster coming, you can just stop and go off in another branch. You can back it up and say, oh, let's back that up 20 years and see if we can't do better. You know, there's lots of things you can do in a virtual reality. It's, not, uh, it, it's almost unlimited in the flexibility that you have.
Yeah, uh, Jill, can I respond to something that yes, you said please. before, too? Yeah, absolutely. yeah, so you mentioned something about um, updates to an operating system. I, I think it's kind of important to make a distinction between a couple of types of um, uh, of realities that we're talking about. One is you know, what, what Tom and I believe in, which is a digital consciousness model. Um, but there's another type that, that gets bandied about a lot in the literature, and it's uh, what I might call post-human sim simulation theory. There's the idea that there's some entity out there that is has created a, uh, you know, 100 year hence simulation that we're playing in you know you know we're we're playing we're, we're we're actually living in the future compared to what we think we are playing in a simulation created by microsoft or whatever the you know facebook or whoever you know the the, the next you know brainiac is um and and there's there's a huge distinction between these two types oh, of, yes. of reality and and that second one that i'm talking about um, doesn't have any kind of synchronization with the mystical experiences that people have. It doesn't really explain the quantum an anomalies. And so when we say things like updating the OS, I don't really think that kind of thing is going on. What it might be is, like, as Tom mentioned, very tiny microscopic changes to, to the system that are you know, making, it, making it improve without upsetting the balance. Right. Well, another, another problem with that uh, ancestor thing is that it's illogical. The reason it's illogical is that that assumes that people are conscious within that virtual reality. In other words, it assumes that consciousness is not outside, that consciousness is not right. a, um, you know, a, a uh, non-physical uh, thing that claims that it must be physical. So we know right away, just looking at the fundamental logic of virtual realities, that doesn't make any sense. The player can't come from inside the reality. It's a virtual reality. It's computed. The virtual reality is just numbers on a hard drive. It's just computation. If you look at the, all the stuff in World of Warcraft, all the players, all the elves, all the trees and rocks and streams, that's just numbers on a hard drive someplace in the server. That's all it is. How do you have a bunch of numbers on a hard drive be conscious? You see, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. That's just the avatars. Consciousness has to be outside the system. And as soon as you understand that there is no virtual reality where consciousness is inside the system, it doesn't make sense. It's illogical. Then this whole thing about the ancestors just kind of goes poof in the smoke. And, uh, you know, it's seen as a, as a not viable, illogical premise. Great. So we do have a question coming in from um, Twitter. The question is from at John Kettner, and he asks, I think, probably what a lot of people have been asking themselves throughout this discussion. And the question is, who is the programmer? Where does it come from? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, I can talk to that some. <laughs> there is no programmer, right? We don't right. have a programmer. So that's the thing. What we have is a need for a virtual reality because consciousness needs to evolve and that evolution requires or it speeds up it's more efficient with the experience you get in a virtual reality so the consciousness system says let's make a uh, entropy reduction virtual reality trainer for our pieces of consciousness so that they can have a more efficient evolution now, i've skipped a whole bunch of steps there and a lot of stuff out but you know we'll try to make it more succinct so first we have the need for a virtual reality now do you program one? No. You program World of Warcraft and you program The Sims, but you don't program this virtual reality. What you do is you come up with a set of initial conditions, something like a very small high, a very small high temperature, high pressure ball of plasma. Okay? And then you have a rule set. If I had that, what would happen? What are the rules for the interactions between these initial conditions, because these things. And then you hit the run button, and when you do, what do you end up with? You end up with a digital bang. You see, it's the big bang, and what does it do? It expands, because that's what the rule set says it'll do. As it expands, it cools, you end up with suns and planets and all this stuff, and it just evolves. So it's an initial conditions and a rule set, and it just evolves. And we have computer scientists in various universities who have created that same sort of thing and, yeah. of course, it's not as quite a grand a scale as our own virtual reality, but that's the way it works. Initial conditions, rule set, and let that thing 
become whatever it becomes. So eventually what it became in our virtual reality is a, you know, a sun like ours, a planet like ours, and, uh, you know, avatars yeah. being evolved and our avatars are still evolving. You know, our well, bodies yeah. aren't going to look like yeah, this they is... do now. You know, we're still in that evolution and consciousness is still evolving. It's not a fixed, done thing. It's a right. system, a natural system, not a supernatural system, just a natural system that is evolving and trying to survive, which means trying to keep its entropy low. And yeah, I think and this is, sorry, go ahead. Fine, I'm sorry, just the fine tuned universe that you speak of, Jim. Yeah, so, so I think that, um, you know, there, there's actually a, a phys physics theory called flexi laws, which, you know, allow the possibility of kind of reaching back into the past and making changes to physical laws so that they eventually evolve toward, you know, something that we, we see now. It's, it's another example of trying to fit, um, you know, trying to fit what we observe into kind of a materialistic paradigm. Yes. Um, what I was actually going to, to mention, though, is that you know, what, what Tom described is an evolution of, of thought, really. Um, and this is where you know, my research kind of spills over into my day job, which is kind of a cool thing. It, it used to be in, in the business world that you had these hierarchies of, uh, of leaders who told everybody what to do. I mean, that was your job as a leader was to say, you know, you do this, you do this, you do this. But now they're finding that that's kind of pointless because there's so many problems to solve that the time that it takes for each uh, you know, each problem to work its way up the chain, get a solution from the person at the top of the chain and, and filter all the way back down, it's completely inefficient. The better thing to do is for the, the person at the top of the chain is to empower everyone below that chain and say, you make the decision, we'll have some feedback mechanisms to make sure we don't go off the rails. But essentially what they're doing is they're starting with some initial conditions, like Tom said, and putting in place the substrate, the foundational elements with some intent, you know, here's what we want to end up doing. You guys decide how to do it, you know, make a little bit of a change. We'll see how that goes. And then we'll evolve from there. It's a perfect example of the fractal that Tom, you were saying in the break, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that that's how it's logical for our system to work that way as well. Yes. Well, there's really no other, no other way for it to work. You know, the idea that you program it is, it's just un, uh, unworkable. It's not like that. You uh, have to let it evolve. It's a natural system. And um, that just makes sense because that solves a whole lot of other problems. Like why do you need the virtual reality and, you know, what it's good for and, you know, what did it, how did it all start in the first place? And there's a whole lot of things then fall out of coming to that conclusion that there is no programmer. I mean, there is original in the sense that the virtual reality you know, has a rule set and has initial conditions and they had to be, somebody had to come up with that, but they didn't come up with that sitting around scratching their heads and say, oh, let's use these initial conditions and this rule set. They tried something and it probably didn't work. So they modified it and it probably didn't work. And that probably went on for a million times before they finally ended up with something that worked. And then they tweaked it and tweaked it and tweaked it. So that's what evolution does. Evolution is a, is a iteration where the input gets you know the output gets fed back into the input and you keep tweaking it so that's the that's what makes sense to me anyway as far as uh, you know who's the programmer yeah and i think another is the programmer yeah i think another thing needs to be pointed out too which is that there's a, a a large category of evidence that there is no you know external programmer so you know one is you know, all of the near-death experiences that people have had, all the out-of-body experiences, yeah. mystical experiences, when, when people, you know, go into a state through rhythmic drumming or dance or meditation or whatever it is, they go into a state and they connect with the whole. They don't, they don't meet a programmer. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they, they, they realize that there is a bigger consciousness that they are part of, integrated into, and... So is everybody else. That that model is the model Tom and I are talking about. Yeah. The the other model where there's some programmer somewhere is not that model at all. So that doesn't that doesn't fit any of the you know huge aggregation of uh, anecdotal experiences that people have had. Yeah, yeah. and you see, we, the, I'm sorry, well, I need to. Uh, 
interject here. We do have to pause for break, but when I come back, hold that thought, Tom. I definitely want to um, spend the entire last segment of tonight's show kind of going into those glitches and spiritual experiences that people have had a hard time describing as far as this theory goes in the past. So put a pin in that, Tom. (laughs) Um, Everyone, we will be right back from a break. So stick around. Hi folks, in a world of GMO, genetically modified organisms that is, chemicals, processed foods, and a healthcare system that's unraveling like a cheap suit, it's time to prepare. God created herbs, and herbs help man. Our body can heal itself, just sometimes we need assistance. You need some help? Get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com. Our mild detox is quite powerful with its unique blend of eight different herbs. And if you're looking for more, our non-GMO supplements will help you with different needs you might have. Health should be a top priority. Take care of your health naturally. Log on to get the tea. Dot com. That's get the tea dot com. Give your body a treat. Let the herbs do their thing naturally. Read all the testimonies on the website. Get the tea dot com. That's get the tea dot com. Sickness and viruses are like intruders, and herbs are like warriors. Let the tea work for you. That's get the tea dot com. You wanted to see me? Yes, please have a seat. So here's the thing: when this company brought you on, we took a chance on you. You didn't have that four-year college degree we typically look for. Right. But we gave you a shot anyway. And since then, you've worked incredibly hard and given it your all. Thanks. You've been an important asset to the team. But I don't think you can be an intern here anymore. (sighs) We want to hire you. You're, You're serious? Absolutely. Find your next great employee. Introduce yourself to the grads of life. Who are they? Talent worth knowing about. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. I won't let you down. I know. Don't miss out on a resource many innovative companies have already discovered. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. I'm getting older and noticing that my body just doesn't work as well as it used to. So I like to keep fit as possible by hitting the gym a few times a week. Recently, I started having a nagging bicep pain and it got so bad I couldn't even lift the weights. When I was complaining about it to a friend, he told me about Angioprim. He said chelation helps remove toxins, heavy metals, and cholesterol in veins and arteries that may cause blockages. You know, after just one week of taking Angioprim, the pain was gone and now... Now I'm back in the gym full strength. Scientific research proves the active ingredient in angioprim has superior oral chelation action that helps promote cardiovascular health. So to learn more, go to angioprim.com. That's A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M.com. Or talk to a trained consultant. Call angioprim toll free at 877-882-7221. You'll feel better with more energy. Call 877-882-7221 or go to the website angioprim.com it's not a lifestyle we chose we were born this way kgraradio.com Welcome back from the break, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I am Jill Hansen, host of the Q Science Project, which brings cutting edge interdisciplinary perspectives and research aimed at exploring the nature of consciousness, perception, and reality to the planet every Friday night from 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern. Tonight, we've been chatting with digital philosophers Tom Campbell and Jim Elvidge about the exciting and perception altering evidence in support of the hypothesis that we exist as virtual avatars in a simulated reality. This is your last chance to engage Tom and Jim directly through through the chat room and through Twitter. So if you're next to your computer, hop over to kgraradio.com forward slash chat room and get those questions into the chat box in all caps. Or you can tag me on Twitter um, at QScience, that's Q-P-S-I-E-N-C-E, and use hashtag QPChat. Um, all right, gentlemen. So I know that Tom <laughs> did have one comment to make about the conversation that was happening before the break. So Tom, do you want to go ahead and start us off? Yes. Um- 
the comment I was going to make, we're talking about this, you know, evolution versus programming uh, yeah. idea. And one of the ways to look at this, to see that evolution is the only solution and that programming is one of those uh, uh, ideas that just fails Occam's razor, is that look at the complexity and mm. the interaction and combine those, the complexity of interaction of all the things going on, say, just in our physical world, in this virtual reality. Again, all the plants and animals and critters and, and stuff that's here and how vastly complex it is. Look at your own body and all your parts and all the cells and all that specialization. And, you know, we look at that and we say, it's a miracle. You know, I mean, wow, you know, whoever built, whoever designed us, you know, was a really sharp engineer and a good scientist because, wow, this is all really complex. Well, you get really dramatic complexity and intricacy out of a fractal. You get that out of evolution. Evolution is a process fractal. And what that means is that you take a simple idea, a simple process like evolution, which means you, you know, something comes out, you output, right? It changes, it evolves, it changes. Now that's the input for new changes. And then that new change thing is the input for more new changes. So it just keeps going around and the changes on the changes. And you have some criteria for that. In the physical world, the criteria was survival and procreation. So these changes just keep coming. And eventually you start with a couple of cells that aren't even quite up to jellyfish standards yet. And you end up with everything that's here because you get this immense complexity out of evolution. This amazing complexity out of this fractal process that just keeps building on itself. A programmer could not sit down and program all of this detail and all of the intricacies that you find here and all the relationships. You see, that would be, it's, it's sort of like the many worlds, you know. Now you're talking about something that is, you know, bigger than, than possible. But yet things like that, fractals, evolve these hugely complex things all the time. That's what they do. So if you look at our, our our world, all you have to do is see the complexity in this virtual reality to know that it had to be evolved because it's all about the interrelationships of everything. You see, programmers don't do that. That's what makes The Sims and the world of War Warcraft see kind of fake because they don't have all those intricate mm -hmm. interconnections between everything because that's just too much for the programmers to do. So that also kind of shoots down, uh, you know, this is our ancestors or our, our predecessors or, you know, somebody out there that's just like us that's doing this. And we're these little chunks of consciousness that run around in their game. Well, that just doesn't make any sense. You see, they're not going to program that. This is an unprogrammable virtual reality. It can only evolve. It's the only thing that makes good sense. Occam's razor kind of throws the programmer out in favor of evolution. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and there are there are constructs in computer science, things like neural nets, which are learning mechanisms. It's not a brute force programming mechanism. It's basically right. a construct that has feedback paths and it says based on what you're what you're receiving about the external world, whether that's, you know, stocks or, you know, medical data or whatever it is, make some adjustments. If those, adjustment, if those adjustments that you made make the system more favorable, keep going with that. If not, retract those adjustments or make them in the other direction or whatever. And so the, that, that, you know, construct will continuously evolve into a very, you know, in tune with what's going on type of system. Right, that's learning. All learning is based on iterative understanding. It has to be an iterative process. It's not a program process. Programming is an iterative right. program. You just build it, and there it is. Yep. Um, that's not something that learns. You see, we as consciousness, what is consciousness? It's a digital information system. That's what consciousness is. It's all about information. And I think one of the things that trips people up, too, is is the sheer complexity of it. And and it's very easy to look at it and say, well, this can't be programmed. It can't be a simulation. We're we're not capable of doing something like this. But the, the fact the fact is fractals are actually very simple things. The, yes. the math behind them is very simple. But the complexity that ge is generated from them is incredible. Yes. And I think it's also very difficult for us as humans to wrap our brains around the concept that something is infinitely large and infinitely small. 
Well, you know, right. infinite is one of those yeah. words that really has no meaning in the real world. Infin- right. Infinity is a is a concept that's handy in mathematics and phys- in physics as far as, you know, as big as you can get. But there is no place that's infinite because if you ever got to infinity, you could always add one to it and now there'd be some other infinity. So you never get to the end. Infinite in simply that, I'm not talking spatially. I'm talking infinite right. in that it just keeps going. So you, right. you know, well, infinite in, in as far as that it's a process that doesn't end. Yes, exactly. it's unbounded. Exactly. And a lot of fractals are unbounded. Every, right. you, know, you, you could, now some fractals that are real simple and some uh, cellular automata that are simple, they'll get to a point where there's no more change possible. But when you have a highly complex, large system, there's always some change possible because with that much stuff all interacting, you know, you take all that to you know to the the, the uh, you know n factorial and whatever and the possible combinations and permutations of all of that is uh, a number that's not infinite but it's awfully large. Yeah, and the whole idea of of infinite resolution or something just it completely breaks down. It breaks down in right. physics. It breaks down in information systems. It's and, and you know it if. If you were to say, uh, you know, there's uh, several categories of, of um, you know, possible creator or something like that. You know, one of them could be an individual. One of them could be, you know, the idea of a god or something like that. But does it really make sense that anybody's going to create something that requires infinite resources, infinite resolution? No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't no, make sense at all, but, which is I, an, more evidence for the digital nature of sure. the world. Right. But like you said, Jim, earlier in the show, you know, in a rendered reality, nothing like the inside of that hotel I'm looking at across the street, it doesn't need to even be rendered on the in on the inside until right. someone actually opens the door and exposes whatever it is beyond it. Right? <laughs> you know, the, same, it's true. the same is it's true for the, yep. the same thing's true for uh, our, our heads is that <laughs> no brains <laughs> need to be rendered inside anybody's skull. I love that. Until some right. surgeon cuts it open and looks at it. Yep. I love yep. that. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> not to break up the party, but we only have a very short period of time left. And I definitely want to make sure that we address some of these, what I've always called glitches in the system. Um, things like, like you mentioned, Jim, reincarnation, um, altered states of consci- consciousness, synchronicities, coincidences, um, you know, paranormal, all of these types of things, these qualitative experiences that in the past has kind of been a block for people as far as a simulation, you know, simulated reality goes. So yeah, whoever, I, go ahead. I, I can't speak to the reason behind these things, but the model that Tom and I are talking yeah. about make every one of those perfectly plausible. Exactly. Um, it's really just leaky data in, in a, in a way. So, um, you know, as we experience a reality, as we experience a lifetime, we don't want to have um, a connection to every single other entity out there and hear everything that they're saying and doing. It would be too much information, too much confusion. Um, we also don't want to have recollections of every detail of every past life that we've, we've ever had, because that would probably defeat the purpose of, you know, believing that what we're doing, we're doing for, uh, you know, for, for, a, you know, a new purpose. So, so we're constrained. Our consciousness is constrained as we play this, you know, virtual reality that we're talking about. It's constrained so that we learn um, and so that we evolve our consciousness in some way. That said, there is still a mechanism to communicate with other individuals, telepathy, to see things that are distant from us, not in our location, non-locality, um, things like that. That's just data. It's just data going between different entities within the system. There's no reason why that can't leak into our conscious world. The purpose for it, I don't fully get. Maybe Tom can comment on that. But but the model makes that all very, very plausible. And the fact that these are subtle things, um, you know, when you take something like a uh, Oh, some of the experiments that have been done with telepathy or precognition or whatever, they're very small effects, and yet they're statistically significant if they can be reproduced thousands of times with very small effects. It's like, you know, flipping a penny. If you flip a penny, um, you know, 10 times and it turns up heads 
six times, that is not st statistically significant. But if you flip it 10 million times and it turns up heads six million times, that's hugely significant. So it's you know kind of a law of large numbers, um, you know, the, the way this works. So I'm not sure if, Tom, you have any thoughts on the, the purpose of some of these synchronicities and things. It, to me, it seems like it's a kind of a hint or a, a little push or a nudge to um, evolve this in some way. Well, a lot of it, uh, Jim, is just the nature of the way the virtual reality has to be run. Once you understand consciousness, and it's a virtual reality, you can understand some of the mechanism that's required, logical processes that are required in order to run this virtual reality. And one of the key things here, again, uh, consciousness is a digital information system. The thing that moves data around is intent. Okay, now we have one of the purposes, say, for what I had mentioned earlier, and that is that uh, focused intent modifies future probability. You need future probability in this simulation because you have to have some idea what's coming next because you're the one, you're the computer is computing all that. It makes it a lot easier if you kind of have a sense of what you're going to have to compute in the next delta T. So you also have, as, that, as time goes on, that future probability, which is everything that could happen and the probability that it would happen it becomes now a, a past. So you have past databases as, as the delta T. Now, delta T is just the, the time cycle in the outer loop of the, of, you know, the, of the code, of the simulation, if you will. So now you have all of these past databases, and that's where you can go to get your past life information and other things. It's just databases. Uh, so that's why they work. The idea that, you, that uh, intent modifies future probability, that's a feedback mechanism in this reality because that means that what we create here is our own creation. So you look out at the world and you say, wow, this is a sick world. You know, look at all those greedy, mean people out there just, just uh, you know, making a lot of trouble. Well, it's like that because we're like that. That right. is a good, honest assessment of the level of quality of consciousness of the people on this planet. So that's why when you have your own intent modifies feedback, then if you're a very fearful person, you tend to create fearful situations. You, you make your fears come true. If you're a very loving and caring person, then you tend to make that come true. So you put all of us people in here with all our fear and our love and everything else, and what you see is what you get. So we get to live the consequences of what we are. That's why that's there. It's just, uh, you know, it's a good schoolhouse that has feedback for its students so that as they grow up or not, they can get the results. They have to live with the results, so to speak. So when you talk to dead Uncle Fred, you're getting that information, you know, through a medium and she's getting it um, from the database. It's just a database. And yes, that database has every thought, feeling, emotion, idea that Uncle Fred had. And yes, Uncle Fred can talk about current events. He can tell you that he hid money, uh, you know, under, under the floorboards at a particular place in the old house, and you can find it there. Um, it's just data in a database. So once you understand consciousness, there is no such thing as paranormal. It's just normal. Everything is normal, and you just have to understand it. And if you think about that, if you go, you know, if you go back in time and we showed people computers and internets, they'd all be considered paranormal, you know, a hundred years ago. Yeah. It, it, uh, it's just paranormal just means we don't understand it. Well, once you understand consciousness, then you can understand all of that stuff that people call paranormal. We're all netted. You know, every individual, every consciousness is netted to every other on a big on this big net. That doesn't mean we're always talking to each other, just like on the internet. Okay, there's billions of websites, but you don't get them all at once. You have to go click on the one that you want. Well, in consciousness, it's intent. You have an intent to connect and to get information or to give information, and that opens up the line. And if you don't want that information being sent to you, you can have an intent to reject it, and it isn't sent to you. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the mechanics of the way the system works. Understanding the mechanics then tells you about lucid dreaming and remote viewing and healing with your mind and, you know, all the rest of that stuff are yeah. just, uh, it's just natural way that consciousness works. So how about meaningful coincidences though? That, that seems to me a little bit out of the normal paranormal realm that you're talking about that, yes. you know, 
Okay, what do they what they happen? Well, you have to understand that this virtual reality is a subset of a larger consciousness system. And that what it's here for, what this virtual reality here for is to help us grow up. And growing up, which I'm not taking the time to, to derive this, but what that amounts to is learning how to be caring, cooperative. I call that the path of love. That's what that's the point of our being here. We're supposed to make choices, and by those choices, we either evolve or de-evolve the quality of our consciousness. We, and uh, in the science, I'd say we either raise or lower the entropy of our consciousness. Okay, so that's what we're here for. Now, the system created this virtual reality as, a, as an entropy reduction trainer for us. The system would like us to succeed because we're a part of that system, and as we lower our entropy the entropy of the whole system gets lowered because we're part of the system. So mm -hmm. we are part of the strategy of this consciousness system's evolution. So it has a vested interest in our success. And often you'll get just what you need at just the time you get it or just the time you need it because that will help you grow up. That's on your path to, to uh, you know, lowering your entropy, on your path to becoming love. And those things will help your understanding. Now, if, if you're not willing, you know, if you can't take that nudge and you just say, oh, that's nonsense. I just made that up. It must have been a dream. Blah, 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 and you, you blow it off, then you're not going to get those. So everybody doesn't live a life with a lot of synchronicity in it. Some people, it happens just once in a while. Some people never. And some people, every day of their life is filled with synchronicity. And the difference between those people is the one whose life is filled with synchronicity is a person who's trying to learn and grow up. They're open to it. You see, they can learn from it. If you can learn from it, the system will help you out and give you those things. Now, that's one cause of the synchronicity. The other is that you're modifying future probability with your intent. So if your intent is for things to happen in a particular way or information you need or growth paths you're working on, that stuff will just tend to materialized for you because you are raising the probability of that happening with your intent you see so those kinds of, that's another so those two things i guess i should say are what creates the idea of synchronicity that things just happen it's just another it's the mechanics of of the virtual reality and of the larger consciousness system yeah and i think um you know along those lines when there are examples of people who have a uh, you know, an astounding experience like um, a huge premonition that if they go further, they're going to get into a car crash in, in, in this particular intersection or something like that. And um, th those things can very easily be a little bit of the system giving them a kick, giving them something that they need. Because at the end of the day, we are all individuated. We do have free will and we are going to do what we're going to do. So if you're going through your life and you're not going to, uh, you know, succeed in a direction or you're not going to make it past the next two minutes and, you know, that's not a good thing for you and it, it's better for you to continue your life rather than reincarnate and start all over again, then maybe the system will get involved or maybe some other entity within the system will get involved and say, hey, by the way, maybe you ought to slow down. Yeah. Particularly if you're on a, a growth path, see, if you're learning. Now, if you're not, if you're just wandering around clueless in the playing field and have no idea what the game's about, then you know, maybe not so much. But right. if you're really working in a growth path and you're making progress, then that's a, a, you know, a, a, a line of success that's worth preserving. So exactly. the system is an intelligent system. We're talking about a larger consciousness system, and we're a piece of it. So do we imagine that it has less consciousness than we do? No, this is a very conscious, aware, intelligent system. And by the way, that's a, a very logical fractal as well. If you're a large system, you know, and you want to evolve, is it easier to just evolve bit by bit? Or is it easier to say, I'm going to break myself up into a whole lot of little pieces and tell each one of those to evolve or give them the intent to evolve right. and break those into ind individual pieces and so forth, which is why we have the plethora of... Uh, living entities that we do have. That's right, because what what lowers entropy is new combinations, uh, growing in new ways that are more productive, which is cooperation and caring, that sort of thing. And the way you get more possibilities is by more actors 
interacting with each mm-hmm. other uh, with free will. So this consciousness system is really a big social system. And that's why you come to the conclusion that, that the reason they're doing this is to lower entropy. Because if you have a big social system, the way it optimizes is by caring, by cooperating, with, by working together. If you have the opposite of love, if you have the fear side, fear and is very self-focused and self-centered and it's all about me and I'm going to grab this and you know I'm going to try to grab your stuff too if I can get away with it and it's very divisive and it's just the opposite of cooperation and caring and so on so those are your two branches and why we're here is to make choices on the path to love and what we need to do here is get rid of the fear that makes us make poor choices you see on the path to high entropy as opposed to love at the low entropy Love it. One last question for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it that you two don't already have your very own weekly talk show? <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, I do have a day job, among other things. <laughs> ah, day job, Jim. <laughs> yeah, my, my excuse is I'm really too busy just trying to juggle the balls I've already got in the air. You know, I can't, um, I mean, I can't imagine do. doing that. I can't keep up with my email. <laughs> I said I can't keep up with my email. I can't keep up with a lot of things that I'm supposed to be doing, and um, I just I know well, I put videos out now. If you go to my YouTube channel, I've got over 400 videos. Every time I do a talk, a workshop, uh, an interview, things like that, if if I can get a hold of it, it's out for free on YouTube. So I've got lots and lots of stuff. So that's kind of my outreach channel is not a radio program, but a a massive YouTube channel with probably thousands of hours of uh, my talking head talking about this subject. Great resource for sure. Yeah. Good stuff. Let's see. Also, another resource for Tom, you both have websites that which are good for, you know, person who wants to go and get a little bit more information about what you're all about and, you know, fill in all the gaps that we didn't quite get to tonight. Um, Tom's website is mybigtoe.com. There's some dashes in there. It's my-big-toe.com. And, and for Jim, quite pretty simple, The Universe Solved. And both of those websites, the titles of the websites go, you know, you both have books. Uh, Tom, of course, the My Big Toe Trilogy and Jim, The Universe Solved. Both excellent books. I highly recommend them. Everyone who found even part of tonight's conversation interesting. There's so much there. We barely, barely even scratched the surface tonight. Um, And Jim, you have another book coming out. I do. Um, Yeah, I just uh, pretty much finished the first draft of it. It's it's being edited now, and it's uh, it's kind of like the first book on steroids, but there's really a lot of uh, new stuff in there. Um, What I've attempted to do is take a real scientific case for uh, you know why this digital consciousness reality um, exists proving that it exists uh, yeah. there, there are different ways to do uh, science you know inductive reasoning deductive reason abductive reasoning you know best fit to the data and using Venn diagrams and and different anomalies and and what kinds of toes will it explain different things, um, it's almost an inescapable conclusion that what Tom and I are talking about here is what it's all about. Um, so it's a very comprehensive you know, way to kind of model things to very clearly explain a lot of anomalies in metaphysics and quantum mechanics and why we don't remember things and why we do, you know, what reincarnation is, what life's all about. Um, but then also, um, you know, the, the kind of science behind demonstrating that this is the best fit to all the data. Right. And Tom, as far as your current research is going, that's, I'm assuming, going to be all be up on YouTube as it kind of progresses? Yep, it's all yeah. going to be up there. Everything, if, if we get the, the scientists to actually do the experiments, that will go up on YouTube. The experiments as I've described them and laid them out and shown how they work, that's all available. My slides are available uh, for that. Um, let's see. The other thing I've got going here is a, is a trip around the world where we've been invited a lot of places. So we're heading off to New Zealand and we'll come back, uh, through Germany and to New York all the way around. And that's coming up this spring. Actually, we started uh, in just a few, in about a month in the middle of uh, February. 
And that are those goes off. And you? if you want to know about any of that stuff, that's at another website. That's www.mbtevents. MBT is in my big toe, events.com. <laughs> and there you can find where I'm going to be and, and uh, what I'm going to be doing there. Fantastic. Jim, anything else to add before we have to? Oh, nothing much. Um, I, I do have a, a Facebook page that a lot of people have joined. Um, and, uh, you know, I blog regularly, there's a forum on my website, you know, I try to make, you know, keep things as interactive as possible. So, um, I think Tom also has a forum, so it's been a good, you know, some good avenues for, for people to communicate with us and, and exchange ideas. Wonderful. Well, gentlemen, thank you both so much for being here tonight. I, it was quite an honor and definitely quite a pleasure to just sit back and kind of watch the, these two minds go at it. So, so thank well, you. Yeah. Personal Thanks so much, Jill, for putting it together. It was great. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's I'm, been fun, Jill. Thank you. Good, good. You know, maybe we'll do it again sometime. I know that I certainly, again, very selfishly enjoyed the conversation. So Excellent. thank you both very much. You're welcome. Thank you. All great right. to talk to you, Tom. Good talking with you. It's uh, been, a, been a while. We used to exchange some emails once in a while, but uh, it's nice to have a chat. Yeah, absolutely. Great. You're Thanks, definitely. everybody. Let's keep it up. <laughs> All right, everyone, that is a wrap on the first episode of the Q-Science Project in 2017. I'm grateful to have had each and every one of you along for tonight's adventure, and thank you for spending your Friday night with us. Um, one more huge thank you to my guests tonight, Tom Campbell and Jim Elvidge, and also to Bill Forte for kind of standing behind the curtain. Remember, all current and future guest and topic information can be found on the Q-Science Project website, which is qscience.org. That's Q-P-S-I-E-N-C-E dot O-R-G. You can also follow on Facebook. That can be found at facebook.com forward slash Q-Science. And also follow on Twitter, which is simply at Q-Science again. Uh, I can't wait to see all of you back here. Same bat time, same bat channel next week. Wishing everyone a great weekend ahead. This is Jill Hansen, host of the Q-Science Project, signing off. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.